In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, you never cease to relate to us in various amazing and creative ways. Through the wonders of technology, though not face to face, you allow our ideas to be shared with ease despite physical distance. You bring us closer to each other in an instance and even to strangers. You help us build new friendships as your virtual messengers. Send your Holy Spirit to inspire us as we begin this online gathering. Bless everyone who toil to make this project possible. The speakers, the facilitators, the technical crew, as well as the participants and viewers. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Blessed Carlo Acutis, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. morning. This is the first session of the Urian Voters Education Webinar Series. I am Maris Gamalo of Social Sciences Division of Father Saturnino Urius University, your facilitator for today. We are web webcasting live from this university in Butuan City, Philippines. We have Diana Shane Ranara of Social Sciences Division as our tech assistant. We would like to acknowledge those who are with us through Zoom and FB Live, as well as our on-site participants. As we draw closer to the national and local elections on May 9, we are holding this voter education to help you choose wisely your candidates who will be our next leaders for the next six years. To make this session more interactive, especially for the students, Let's play a game later. For, Zoom, for our Zoom participants, a link will be given in the chat box. And for those who are joining us through Facebook Live, we will, you will find the link in the comment section. Click the link in your, for your game later on. Now, let's take a look at the video to provide us a better context of the situation. The Philippine national elections is less than a month away. Who will you vote for? Have you decided? Why will you vote for these people? And why not? Through the Orient Poll survey, majority of the respondents from the tertiary level show that fake news and historical revisionism influence their choices. FSUU values how important and critical this democratic exercise is and mobilizes to educate and remind the Orion community on how important it is to critically discern in choosing the country's future leaders grounded on the university core values. Voting is a right, a privilege, but most of all, a responsibility. FSUU aims to breed responsible, rational and radical voters through this webinar series. 
Remember, information shapes decisions. Let us contribute to a community of well-informed people. To officially welcome us to this session on Orion Core Values, a guide for discernment in choosing the next leaders, we give you the Vice President for Administrative and Student Affairs, Engineer Zenaida Azura. Virtual clap, please, and actual clap. Good morning. Welcome everyone to this morning session. Father Saturnino Urius University, through the concerted efforts of various offices of the university, conducts this Orion Voters Education Webinar Series. I would like to welcome everyone to this morning session, focusing on how the Orient core values of unity, religiosity, integrity, altruism, and nationalism will be our guide for discerning our choices come May 9. In less than a month, we will be exercising our right to suffrage. The election scheduled for May 9 will give the country a new president, vice president, 12 sen senators, and a new term for local officials. This coming election is a crucial one because the next president will be deciding our future for the next six years. The numbers from the Commission on Election showed that more than half of those who registered to vote were aged 18 to 30 years old. Thus, it is reasonable to assume that a big chunk consists of young people. In one article that I have read, it says, it's no exaggeration to say that the Filipino youth could decide the winners of the 2022 national elections. It is important then that as an educational institution, we will educate our voters about this electoral exercise, help them to be more knowledgeable about the candidates and the governance issues that the candidates should be judged on and guide them on how to discern the next leaders. As Orients, we are called to let our light shine now and forever. That's our motto. We are bearers of light and let that light be our guide and our guide for others. That even in what we seem to be dark, there is always that flicker of light, a flicker of hope, not just for you, but for others as well. We are the hope of our nation, and our votes on May 9 will be the foundation in building our nation, so we have to discern and vote wisely. Thank you, and good morning once again. Thank you very much, Mam Zen, for that warm welcome. Our speaker this morning obtained his master's degree in spirituality and intercultural theology at the Catholic University in Nijmegen, the Netherlands. He finished doctorate in theology with distinction at the same university. He was previously engaged in church and political affairs being the executive secretary of the Association of Major Religious Superiors in the Philippines from 2001 to 2003 and 2009 to 2013. He is currently the Dean of Studies of the St. Peter College Seminary of the Diocese of Butuan. He, al he is also a professor of the doctorate school program in this university. He teaches as well in major theological seminaries in the country. Dear friends, to speak on Urian Core Values, a guide for discernment in choosing the next leaders, please welcome Father Marlon Lakal, PhD.
Good morning, everyone, especially those who are following us uh, online by uh, our FB, FB page and uh, for those who are following our streaming. This morning, I will be sharing with you some uh, reflections that may be deemed uh, important in our process of choosing future leaders or the next generation of leaders of this country. And as Urians or members of Father Saturnino Urius University community, we are expected to contribute to an, you know, to an enlightened or well-discerned decision as we choose our political leaders. Now, speaking about Urian process of political discernment, we have to understand a very important reality. Politics in the Philippines, as it is practiced and lived out today, is heartful, very divisive, and the biggest bane in our life as a nation. And to say this in a very, you know, straightforward manner, Politics is dangerous to our lives as people, very pernicious to our lives as people. Having said this, we have to admit the fact that politics in the Philippines had been governed by money, first and foremost, through massive element of vote buying, and also the use of guns, and goons. These are happening most especially in the countrysides. In short, Philippine brand of politics is thoroughly dirty, divisive, and destructive. And to say the least, it is tainted with so many moral issues and concern. Now, in this presentation, I have to let you to understand why is it that as a university, a Catholic university or a Catholic institution of learning, we have to guide our people into discerning well. The first of the issue that has to be dealt with, and that is to establish our distinctive identity as Uriens, is that primarily we are a Catholic institution. And we had been questioned, probably the church in a way had been questioned, why is it that we are involved in politics? Taking into consideration what trolls or, or online uh, bashers had always been insinuated and asserted down the line of our history, that there should be clear separation of the church and of the state. And that we have to clarify as well what is the role or what would be the role that has to be played the by the lay, the religious, the clerics, and the bishops when it comes to influencing our moral decision and choices. Now, we have to understand that people had always been, no, had always something to say with church and politics. And I am emphasizing this because FSUU is a Catholic entity, no, a Catholic university. What is in this church and what does people say about our church, especially people in government? or those that had reacted thoroughly to the participation of the church in the arena of politics. So reactionary people in government would always say, the church is pakialamero, it blocks the middle in politics. At dapat hindi niya gagawin niya because of the separation of church and state. The church, they would say, has no say in politics. Now, that had always been the mindset that they are trying to inculcate to our people. And they would rather also say 
that the separation of church and state should be respected at all times. This we could see and read every time post in the social media about a priest or a bishop apparently expressing critique or critical reaction to people in government and to the system of politics that we are all experiencing as a nation. Now, the painful truth before Having, having said all those considerations about how people in government would react, the painful truth is that we had also an experience that the church doesn't care at all about politics. We could, we could go back to our history. In the early years of martial law, up until before the 1980s or the late 70s, that the point of awakening in the Philippine church had happened. But prior to that, the church never interfered or will never be critical about government and governance. However, since EDSA, which had been, you know, demonized by, by the few or, or the trolls, for that matter, would always let us realize that church and politics are inseparable. Why is that so? Church and politics would always be inseparable because of the fact that the church, having no agenda at all, will always be the voice of the voiceless. That the church will never compromise if the government would be neglecting its responsibility of serving the people. Church and politics, again, is inseparable because how could we allow it to happen when people say the government is for the body and the church is for the soul? We are not living in a dichotomized body and spirit thing. We live as one human being. Having said that, therefore, the separation between church and politics becomes a reality and never will be an option. And the anchor why is that so was the fact that when Jesus came, when he was among us, he lived into our midst and he saved and work for those who are concretely poor, hungry, sick, and those who were living in hopelessness. And that mark of Jesus, that life lived out by Jesus, is the very identity of the church. And that is not just the concern of government. Speaking about poverty, talking about, you know, people who are hungry. Well, the church had its own share of misgivings, but certainly the church had been living true to its obligation and commitment to build hospitals, to organize feeding, to help people organize themselves so that they can move out of their sphere of poverty and hopelessness. Despite of and in spite of what trolls would say against the church. Despite of and in spite of the church imperfection, the church is an institution worldwide that had been the primary source of hope for so many people. Now, I think this is commonsensical that if we are Catholic, our faith is never detached from our being Filipinos. You cannot live your being Catholic at home and when you go to Urius, you will be a Filipino and a non-Catholic. That cannot be. We cannot compartmentalize our religious identity with our being citizens of this world. 
And so for those who had been criticizing Catholic universities who had made a stand, or those who had bashed priests and bishops who clearly and openly criticized people in government, even those who are aspiring to obtain power in this country, you will never win because the church will never stop. The situation would demand that the church should make a stand all the time. And I think that is the reason why we are being guided towards an enlightened position because as entity of a Catholic university, we must come up with an enlightened position. Having said that, we have also to understand that our action as a Catholic institution is simply our response to the imperative of the gospel. Uh, when we say imperative of the gospel, what it is all about? It is all about justice and peace. It is all about communion. It is all about truth and reality. It is all about denouncing falsity and evil. It is about unmasking idols. It is about leading people to light. We cannot allow darkness to overwhelm us. We have had enough of darkness as a people. In the time of martial law, I could say that was the most you know, dangerous times that we had lived as a nation. All over my body, I had the mark of martial law at a very tender age. I experienced being tortured, being persecuted and manhandled by the then Philippine Constabulary and the Composite Infantry Battalion of the INP. An uncle of mine, who was then a labor leader in Davao, had been arrested and never, ever had been seen again. People had been a witness to the cruelty of those dark years. Hence, we cannot not speak against it openly. The church, our Catholic institutions, must therefore stand up because that's exactly the demand of the gospel. And we have to remember this, that if time comes that we hear nothing from the church, we must be worried because that means that the church had stopped with its mission of propagating the gospel. If we will not speak as a Catholic institution critical to government and governance, then we must be afraid. We may lose the stream of our, you know, the, re the relevancy of our existence as church and as a Catholic institution. Mas nakakatakot po pagtatahimik na lang ang inang simbahan. Mas nakakatakot po pag hindi nakikibo ang mga katolikong paaralan, kolehiyo at mga universidad. Because our silence would mean that we are giving our consent to the reign of darkness and evil. And as a Catholic entity, we can never, ever allow that. Now, this reflection of ours is geared towards this following objective. Number one, to give us a space to discover and learn about what the church is saying about politics, election, and governance. It becomes a space as well to listen and to dialogue. We have to learn the craft of listening amidst the euphoria of the social media, which had become now the basis of our decisions. I had been troubled knowing 
that many young generations, including our university clientele and students, had lost stream of history because they refused to learn the art of discernment. They simply would take on the memes, TikTok, Facebook as their basis of facts. And I think in the following days, you will be discussing about the distortion that is at work in this platform that many of us had been engrossed with nowadays. This reflection as well supposedly would afford us an authentic understanding of the issues at hand. We should not only be blindly following our idols. Politics is a vocation supposedly as holy as the priesthood. We must therefore scrutinize people running for office so that they will fit into the criteria of which the gospel and our prayers would lead us to. And this platform as well that we are doing now will allow us to look into the character, the background, and the platform of every candidate, especially those who are gunning for the presidency. And this will also allow us to scrutinize those candidates based on the above-mentioned objectives. That means, when we make our enlightened decisions, mga kapatid, hindi po yan dahil loyal tayo sa isang politiko or political line or political color. It has something to do with a process that we should all undertake. Now, as Orient people or people of you know, a distinctive Catholic identity, we have to understand the dream of every Filipino family and household. Work, education, health, security, food, shelter. These are the primary dream, needs, rights of every Filipino family. Good for us, if we have work still now. But later on, I will also be showing to you the data of which the next president has to deal with. And hopefully, this dream of ours will lead us to scrutinize every candidate. What are their platforms of government pertaining to generation of jobs? Their platform now, pertaining to the issue of education, regarding health care, regarding food security. We have to understand now our, our food basket is losing its stream because of rampant smuggling and issue of corruption. And also the fact that many of our farmlands had been converted by people in power into huge subdivisions plantations, and golf courses. We must never forget these dreams because these dreams of every Filipino will definitely be the very condition that our elected officials in the coming six years has to work on with and to deal with. So we must look at their track records of service pertaining to job generation, food security, home, shelter, education, etc. We must scrutinize them based on our aspiration and dreams as a Filipino people. Mahira po kasi na loyal tayo sa isang political uh, wing or political color without knowing what is the capacity of this person running without understanding the track record of this person running? Especially if they themselves had been saddled with issues of corruption and narrative of revisionism in our history. 
Having said this, we have to understand the situation that will be the burden or the cross that the next president or senators or leaders of this land has to deal with. Number one, one out of five Filipino students failed to enroll in 2020 and 2021. One out of five. Two out of ten. That is 20% of students and pupils. So there were so many backlog in the educational system. And also the issue of, you know, subsistence and um, mga, mga butcher butcher issues sa, sa mga senior high schools, uh, educational subsidies sa mga junior high schools, etc., which is now in danger owing to the fact that the government had no money at all. So to say, there is a serious issue and problem pertaining to education. Number two, 4.25 million able-bodied Filipinos who are supposedly be working are now unemployed. And this is a serious problem. We have to see what are the plans of people running in order to address this 4.25 million jobless people. Plus, we have also 8.7 million underemployed Filipinos in 2021. We would say that is because of the pandem pandemic. But mind you, before the pandemic, this already had soared so high. We have also to deal with the reality that in 2021, 255,714 workers had lost their job under the 8,070 establishments that either shut down or ceased their operation because of the pandemic. If the government cannot afford these people job, it will be a serious problem in the coming years. We have also to deal with the fact that there are 4.2 million Filipinos, families of, of, of families who had experienced hunger based on SWS survey in May of 2021. Well, when people are jobless, the prime effect would always be hunger. When people are living in poverty because they have no job, naturally their families will suffer from it. Imagine 4.2 million Filipinos. And if you would multiply that into an average of five family members, 20 million Filipinos out of the 105 million population of this country had experienced hunger. How will the next president solve this menace? We have to find it out through their plan of governance. And we have 4.5 million Filipinos that doesn't have their own land. So the issue of informal settlers, ginatawag natog squatters, had increased despite of the fact of the claim by few people in government that this issue had been addressed or dealt with. We cannot counter all these facts. These are all facts, figures based on facts and not on distorted sources that many of us now had believed and followed with. 
Taghan pa kay tag problema isip nasud mao na nga di gud ta mag yaga yaga og pili. Di gud ta mag yaga yaga pili. 15 billion anomaly in feel health. Who will forget this? We are all contributors of feel health. Nothing had been done so far on this anomaly. There were efforts to cover up, but no serious investigation and punishment on this massive corruption had been done so far. How will the upcoming government deal with this? How will the upcoming government deal with the issue pertaining to the mismanagement of funds of the Department of Health during the time of the pandemic? The family scandal that erupted on our faces via the social media platforms. It was not a creation of a politician losing his dream and wanted to reinvent himself despite of his being an enabler of this government in the past. It was hard facts, you know, happening in front of us. We have also to deal with the reality that our utang as a nation, later on I will be presenting as well the data of how much each president had contributed to our pambansang utang. But all of them had been shadowed by the utang of this present regime that amounted to 11.7 trillion. Your children and your children's children will be the one to pay for this. And how will our candidates deal with this issue? We must also take into consideration that the war on drugs, officially at least from, from records of the police and some human rights communities, had reached to 29,000 people killed, AJK style, non-Laban style. Are we going to support a candidate who had made a pledge to continue such wanton display of disrespect to the sanctity of human life and human rights? We must therefore scrutinize our candidates. And we must never forget the issue of the West Philippine Sea. According to estimates by scientists and experts, the damage there caused by our inability to reclaim it effectively using the platform that is available to us like the world um, courts, no? the, the international court, or following the decision of the international tribunal. The Philippines had lost approximately 231.7 billion of coral reefs, mga isda, no? 644 billion nga mga isda that we were not able to harvest in our very own territories. What will be the position of our candidates pertaining to the issue of West Philippine Sea or our national patrimony and territory. Well, when we speak about all of these things, trolls and enablers would always claim that this issue had been concocted and invented only by a certain political color or political group which science will vehemently disagree with the solid facts. These are not fake news. These are not peddled by enablers of fake news. These are all in books, in the records, in, in, in investigations by our uh, respectable, reputable institutions in the country. 
we can never deny these facts. These are all solid truth. And this must guide us as Urians to scrutinize intensely our respective choice for the next president and law builders. The, the problem with our, you know, basis of, of truth and facts nowadays is that it's not anymore science. The problem is it is based on memes and invented lies by people who wanted to cover up things and to reinvent themselves to be the ultimate solution and remedy of our problem as a nation. Therefore, as Urians, as, as Catholic people or Catholic institution, we must never allow ourselves to be deprived of these facts, to be blinded by these memes and trolls. We must focus our discernment based on this difficult reality that the next leaders of this country has to be decisively act upon. That's why very important is the track record of the candidates. Never forget that. Is the candidate we are supporting or we will be choosing free from the blemish of corruption here present? I had forgotten to include here the issue which is still ongoing relative to the issue of the PIDAP scum. We are, our frontliners are dying of hunger. Our people are dying of hunger. But look how massive and intensive the issue that had been, you know, eating up the entire spear that supposedly our people has to engage or enjoy with, which is a better life. Deprived to us by corrupt people serving in government then up until today. And aside from this fact, we are also confronted with the reality we are also confronted with the reality that the past and present political and self-interest groups have come together again. Those that had been judged, persecuted, and accused of massive corruption are now uniting to support a common interest, and that is definitely to protect them from future, you know, persecution. They are uniting again. We could see them in the news. The family of the then dictator, plus the great power that was hosted in 2021, that one who had been accused of electoral sabotage and fraud, they are sitting next to each other, brushing each other's elbow, talking about protecting their vested interest. And that should alarm us as a nation and as a people. When corrupt politicians gather together, they are not talking about how will they serve us. Definitely, they are talking about how to get more money, how to exact more from the blood of the already impoverished Filipino electorate and how to protect their interest. They are at it again today. They are back in the stream today. In fact, many of them are running. And we are blinded by their supposed achievements and accomplishments. We are blinded 
by their being handsome or good at dancing budots. My friends, we should never forget those people. We should never forget entities that had contributed to the recent state of Philippine economy, to the recent state of the empowerment of our people. We must never forget them. Now, as I had said, I will also be showing to you the contribution of its president relative to our external debts. Kanim, dili po ni fake news. If you wanted to know, search COA, BIR, and many other governmental institutions. The Marcoses had contributed 27.5 billion to our debt. Aquino, the mother, had contributed 2.9. Ramos had contributed 15.3. GMA also had contributed 22.2. Pinoy, may his soul rest in peace, had contributed 3.5 billion U.S. dollars to our external debts. And the trolls are saying that 30 years of Yellow tard, tawag nila, no? 30 years of yellow tard. When is the 30 years happen? 22 years? 6 years? 6 years? 2 and a half years? 9 years? That one there? And the last one, 6 years. And yet we are blinded by that fake news that we have been squandered by a certain political caller in the last 30 years. While figure will speak for itself that there are two great political names who had caused the misery of this country. And yet, trolls and scums would accuse one and two entities to have caused all these things to our country. My dear friends, as I said, this is not fake news. This is certainly based on science and facts. And let these facts speak to us for us to come up with a clear, enlightened decisions. We should not hinder the truth to influence our thinking. Because if we will do that, then I would be sorry for you and the future of your children's children. Now, the Pope, Francis, had beautifully said that politics according to the social teachings of the church is the highest manifestation of charity because it serves the interest of common good. This is politics in its ideality. Supposedly, politics should serve the common good. But the way things are happening now, politics in this country had served only the vested interest of the few and the rich. The Pope was right. Politics, when it serves the common good, should be palatable to us. But politics that had been riddled by corruption and questions of integrity, we must be alarmed over it. Having said this, we have therefore to go into the details of the guidelines that should be considered when we choose our candidate. There are few guidelines 
that is anchored on the teachings of the church and the ideals of FSUU for that matter. The first of this guideline is the stand and the possession of politicians when it comes to respect for life, human rights, and human dignity. And when we speak about life and dignity of the human person, we are talking about the sacredness of life because everyone is made in the likeness of God Whoever you are, whatever race and age or physical condition you are in. There should be no dichotomization. There should be no exclusion. We must ensure that life and dignity will at all times be protected. We have therefore to ask our chosen candidates this question. What is their stand relative to the issue of human dignity and life? We have to ask the track record of your candidates how they look at the issue of human rights. Human rights should be inviolable, inalienable, dilipoidi ibalhin, and must be universal. What is or what was the track record of the candidate you are supporting when it comes to human rights? Is your candidate and his family clean when it comes to human rights issues and violation? Is your candidate free from blemish when we speak about the issue of political harassment, torture, and extinction, killing? Or are your candidates enablers of human rights violators? Katoliko mo, Christianos mo, and you are clapping your hands to a person or to a candidate who would support, kill them. You are a disgrace to God. You are a disgrace to the church. So we have to ask the question, how is our candidate faring when issue of human rights is at hand? The second guideline should be the issue of corruption and accountability. The data earlier had showed who had emblemished this country with so much debts. Who are those politicians who in the guise of infrastructural development build monuments for themselves in order to cover up the massive corruption that they themselves had institutionalized as a politician and as a family. I am smiling every time people would say, if you dislike this politician or if you don't like the politicians from before, do not pass through this place, do not use this, this facade, do not pass through this, this calle, etc. As if it is coming from their personal pockets. God! Mauna'y utang na ilang giutang, hangtod ka ron, mga apo ninyo mo bayad. Do not idolize them. It is not their money. It is yours. Your children's children. And a huge chunk of those had been pocketed by this politician or family. When we speak about corruption, it is the greatest shame and problem of our country. We are one of the most corrupt nations. Our government has never eradicated it owing to the fact that people in government is involved in corruption themselves. 
every time I would hear how the DOH budget for the pandemic has been mishandled and how many billions had been embezzled by the family scandal, I cannot stop but, you know, beat my lips in anger and disgrace. How can these people in government enjoy the perks of corruption? Samantalang thousands and thousands of our health workers, of our people, had lived in terrible misery because of this pandemic. When we speak about this corruption, we have to ask our candidates, how is their track record? Though they have issue of abuse and misabuse, misuse of public and private office to accumulate wealth for themselves and for their families, That's why we have to look at every candidate's resource. If they could throw billions of campaign expenditures, expect the worst corruption to happen after election. When will they get all those money that they had thrown away? Good for some politicians. They had inherited billions of corrupted money from the past. And they are now enjoying its interest at the expense of the truth, at the expense of a generation that has to suffer because of their inability to renounce and denounce the evil of corruption. We must also understand that, that you know, Corruption is an economic and social problem, but more so, it is a moral decay. When I say moral decay, it has become endemic, massive, systemic, and rampant in our politics. A continuing culture in government from top to bottom. We can never deny this fact. As I said, this is the truth that will haunt us in making our choice. So you must therefore scrutinize the track record of your politician, whether they were involved in corruption or not, whether they were given clearance by government offices and entity, that they had passed the scrutiny of audit and responsibility but if they are mired with corruption never vote for them and if you will do so I will grieve for you and your children's children the third element that we have to you know consider in choosing our candidate should be an issue pertaining to political dynasty and platform of government. Kaya yung mga kandidato na may pamangkin, asawa, ama, ina, anak, na lahat tumatakbo, utang na loob, do not choose them. For the sake of your children's children. People that had been engrossed with political dynasty clearly have one thing in their mind, to protect the vested interest of their family. There may be a few exemptions to that fact, but majority, we can never change that fact. And then, of course, the issue of platform of government, which uh, we will go back later on. No, babalikan natin yan. I, 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 um, handpick at least five candidates who have um, either indirect or direct proposed platform of governance. 
The fourth element that should guide us as Urians in choosing our candidates is their stand relative to the issue of the environment. The country now is facing serious issue of irresponsible mining. Legal, illegal, huge scale, large scale, or small scale. Look what happened to Davao de Oro recently. A province whose mining industry had been controlled by people in power. Look what happened to Agusan del Sur a few months back. Presently, look what happened to Sorigao. Shergao, Dinagat. And just last week, look what happened to Bye Bye Leite. Environmental destruction is in our face. It is not just an issue of being irresponsible. Our common home had been bastardized and destroyed by people in power. Look at the narrative of the entire region of Caraga when it comes to illegal logging. Samar, who owned big logging concessions there in the past until now. Look at the issue of unplanned housing, the issues of informal settlers or squatters, and then the problem pertaining to global warming, climate change, or now it is becoming a climate disaster issue. What is the stand of your candidate relative to environmental protection? What is the stand of your chosen politician when it comes to mining and logging? Are they not the ones who had caused us this problem on the first place. That's why I said again and again, we should never forget what had happened in the past because what happened in the past had contributed to what and who we are in the present. And that will definitely influence and determine our collective future. The fifth guidelines as Urians will be an issue pertaining to patrimony and territory. What is or what should be the stand of the candidate relative to the West Philippine Sea issue or in relation to China, for example? If they are still following the same political line of the present regime, then we have to expect the worst in the years to come. Definitely, we will be losing a precious part of our territory. And of course, number six, we have to scrutinize the candidate's option for the poor and their views pertaining to the common good. Why am I, I am including option for the poor? We are a church entity. And as a church entity, our concern, our preference would always be for the poor. But more so when someone would be seated at the echelon of power in Malacanang. He or she must have a track record of being always in solidarity with the poor. He or she must have a history of always being there when the poor needed them the most. Don't rely on memes. I would dare say 95% of those were lies. Go straight to facts. Wala mang mawawala pag magre-research tayo. 
wala pong mawawala if we read books in history. Wala pong mawawala if we scan the pages of the past. And of course, speaking about option for the poor, our concern for them should be the best te test of a society. And the way we treat them, the vulnerable members, the poor, would determine the level of moral standing that we have. So if your candidate had always been visible in helping the poor, then that candidate must be the one. But if that candidate can only be seen, can only be seen shaking hands with people during campaign period, for God's sake, junk, those candidates. That's why napaka-importante po, mga kapatid, is for us to look at the track record of our candidates. Look at the history of what the candidates had done when people are besieged with hunger. Look at the track records of the candidates when people had suffered because of calamitous events. Look at what the candidates had done to be authentically of service to our people. And of course, when we speak about the common good, now when we speak about the issue of common good, It has something to do with our love for others, our desire for goodness for others, and taking effective steps that the well-being of others will be safeguarded and protected. Are your candidates inclined for this? If not, then look for another one. To desire for common good, based on Carita Veritate, is to make sure that someone would strive toward it and that should be our requirement for living in a just and loving society. Does your candidate have this track record of following the norms of love and justice? Or are they great violators of the law? If so, it's high time you select another one. Common good in politics would always call for the right and duty of all towards participation. That's why we are doing this discernment process to participate in our collective discernment of making sure that we will be choosing the right person for the job. And when we speak about common good, we have to look at the capacity of the candidate to ensure the destination universally of goods, meaning their capacity to ensure that the need of the poor will be dealt with, that the need of the homeless will be dealt with. If not, then choose another candidate. Now, all of these guidelines have been anchored in the Bible, in the sacred scriptures, in the constitution of our country, in the social teachings of the church and the Ten Commandments, as well as anchored on our Urian core values of unity, religiosity, integrity, altruism, which is selfless concern for the well-being of others, and our sense of nationhood or nationalism. Those six elements should therefore influence our process of making a choice and an enlightened decision. Now, aside from those guidelines, 
we must also look at the platforms of government by our respective candidates. And we have to note that pronouncement and platforms may sound alike, but in truth, they are different. No? Tanaw na to ang kalainan sa platform o sa uh, pronouncement. Ang pronouncement, maunay spoken words sa kandidato sa mga issues at hand. Panalitan, na ay formal forum, na ay debate, that's their pronouncements. But if your candidate would not attend debates so that people may hear their pronouncements on fundamental issues, then we have a problem. A platform is a more formal one. It is a written plan of a candidate. A plan that will definitely guide him or her when he would assume office. So, at a glance, dalhon mo na ako sa mga uh, platforma di gobyerno sa pipila ka kandidato nga ako ang tanaw. So, look at uh, Leo Didi Guzman. Um, of all the candidates, he is the poorest. He doesn't have massive political machinery. He doesn't have business support group. He doesn't have interest group. He doesn't have um, um, influence you know, when it comes to money, power, and goons. But look at his platform of government. He assured us of new politics and new economy, anchored on his stand on economy, politics, social development, and the rest. Kaning Toloka major concerns had served as a guide for his platform of government, which gives emphasis and premium to the workforce, mga manggagawa. And his politics will be about human rights and democracy and many more, and then social uh, protection, especially of the least, the lost, and the most abandoned. His um, platform is quite interesting. Um, some scholars would say uh, too idealistic, but politically correct. Too idealistic, but politically correct. He had a written platform of government. Next is, well, I would rather say he is the most um, senior and experienced politician of them all. He had been a chief of the, of, of the police before. He had been serving in the Senate for number, a couple of number of years, though it was dis disrupted when uh, he becomes fugitive of the law. But he has clear economic roadmap as a platform through comprehensive health agenda, meaning relative to the issue of the COVID-19, because that is an issue that the next president has primarily to deal with. And then the rebooting of our economy, the improvement of tax administration, meaning running after tax evaders, and also the reinventing of the government. So he is uh, promising a platform of clean, corrupt, free government. And we have to give credit where credit is due. Being Lakson was the first, and I think originally the only senator who refused to take his share in the PDAF, the Priority Development Assistance Fund of previous Congresses in this country, which had become the very tool of massive corruption in our government. So that's Ping Lakson Sr. I have difficulty looking for written platform of government by BBM. He only attended one debate in uh, Kibuloy's network. And we all know the, the, it would be, I think, the reason why many candidates would not tread into SMNI is the fact that it is the holiest of all TV stations owned by the appointed Son of God. Uh, they might be afraid, or some of the candidates uh, jokingly aside, no? 
Might be afraid to tread on that holy ground or hallowed ground. So I based my reflection on what he had pronounced. This is not a platform of government, but based on his pronouncement that he will have job creation, he would revitalize the small and the medium entrepreneurs, he will promote tourism, he said about health, and more importantly, he will continue the legacy of Digong, PRRD. Especially PRRD's uh, War on Drug and Build, Build, Build. And of course, when I summarized his platform of government, this had always been the only thing we will hear from him. Unity. Whatever that means, I will leave it up to your interpretation. The next candidate who had been in the limelight recently because of his non-stop attack to a specific politician is Isko Dumagoso. Naasya 10-point agenda, housing, education, labor and employment, health, tourism and uh, creatives, information, etc., industry, agriculture, good governance and then smart governance. All of this, he said, had been done in the city of Manila and he wanted to replicate in the entire country. But we must research very well as well what he had done in Manila. But to give due respect to him, he was able to write down a formal platform of government. And this will serve as his guide. The next, of course, is very prominent, ang atong pambansang kamao. Of all the candidates, he had the most recent platform of government, 22 of them. 22-round priority agenda, corruption, economy, employment, ang iyahang kanunay balik-balik, free housing sa tanan ko, tumawa pay, pay balay, balayan niya. And then sustainable livelihood, improved healthcare, education, agricultural development, etc. He had the most written platform that all of this, he said, will be his priority if he wins the presidency. The next is Lenny Robredo, the sitting president of the country. He developed his platform on two anchors. Kalayaan sa COVID plan, hanap buhay para sa lahat. So he had spoke, she had spoken rather about uh, good governance, about uh, employment, about agriculture, about healthcare plans, etc., about issues pertaining to employment and joblessness, etc. And of course, we have to give credit where credit is due. Since she's the only one running for office who was able to garner almost annually a clean audit from the Commission on Audit in her term as Vice President. And of course, of course she was able to sustain all her programs, not relying on government funds and sources, but through the initiative of non-governmental organizations where she worked with closely in the last 10 years of her life. Having said all of this, I did not venture into the platforms of others because I, haven't, uh, I wasn't able to find one, no? uh, and I don't know them uh, thoroughly, so katurang lima, para at least na atay basis for comparison. Having presented the guidelines of choosing, having presented their platform, the challenges that confronts us as Urians and as church is the issue pertaining our ability to dig, to dig into the problem of our society. There is an issue as well when it comes to 
engagement and politics that we should do through political education, like what we are doing now. Unfortunately, not all priests and bishops would be courageous enough to make a clear political stand. And we have to understand that when we say the church should not be partial, it doesn't mean that we can be neutral. Partiality is not neutrality. The church can never be neutral when it comes to the issue of corruption. The church will never be neutral when it comes to the issue of unemployment and poverty and hunger. Even if we have our imperfections as a church as well. But we cannot be neutral when human rights and human dignity had been violated and bastardized. Neutrality as a church would mean we are taking the side of the victimizer and the oppressor all the time. But if we will speak out, we will touch and teach moral nets to people to make an enlightened choice. If we will counter massive bout buying, by way of, you know, protecting the integrity of the electorate, then that is not neutrality at all. We are taking the side of goodness and truthfulness. We can never be neutral. And it is an illusion if we say the church must be neutral. We cannot be neutral. Now, as church, we are therefore tasked to do poll watching. Challenge is ang siyang ay natong buhaton, no? As a uh, Orian community. And creation of citizens' arm to protect our votes. And we have to take note that morality is not just personal, but the issue of ethics and morality is social as well. We have our responsibility to correct lies with facts and truth. We have the moral obligation to renounce revisionism of history because that is a lie. We must renounce corruption at all levels because that deprived the poor of what is due them. Now, as Uriens, we may ask ourselves the following question. What else we must do to effect change in the society and in the church where we belong? Choosing a leader with questionable moral fiber will never help us deal with the issues of our people. And for us Oriens, we have to ask ourselves, until when should we close our eyes to the reality that too little had changed in our society? And what else we should do to effect true change? Many politicians have been speaking or talking about change, but what sort of change? Change for their interest or change for the well-being of the people? And of course, for the leaders gunning for the highest possession of the land. Are you happy living in illusion that the lives of our people will improve will you at the hymn of power while in truth up until now nothing significant had ever changed you are very loyal to a particular politico you refuse to look at yourself are you better off than before now are your families living a more comfortable life now 
Stop blaming the narrative of false history that what we had experienced as, you know, terrible situation is caused only by one political caller. It all started with 22 years of unriddled and uncontrolled dictatorship and tyranny. My dear brethren, my dear brothers, we must always took to heart what the Bishop's Conference had called us to do in this election. We must form circles of discernment the way we are doing now and delay to experience the right and duty to support candidates that are truly qualified and public service oriented. Not only because of the name, not only because they are artista and famous, for God's sake. Make a stand as a lay, as a teacher, as a student, and your choice must be for someone who is truly, based on track record, capable of loving and serving the poor. And whose public service tent had never been blemished and tainted with narrative of corruption. And as a church, as a Catholic university, we must engage in a principled partisan politics. Many people would say that the problem with the church or with Catholic institutions nowadays is we criticize people who are aspiring for power. Adili mi mo apilog dibate kay pagpangdaot ratanan ang isulti. Telling the truth, my dear friends, is never a character assassination. If that is the truth, then you have to learn to live with it uncomfortably. But mind you, the worst enemies that we have to face in this election are those who are best disguised. Those that refuse to accept narratives of darkness in history. Those who refuse to abide by the rule of law. Those whose candidacy is anchored on money and corruption. Yet they disguise themselves as the best option there is for us. And finally, I wanted to close this political discernment process with what Cardinal Sin, the late Cardinal Sin, had uttered. He said, My duty is to put Christ in politics. Politics without Christ is the greatest scourge of the nation. Do not set aside the issue of morals, faith, and value in this election, my dear people. Take that as the basis of your choice. Make it as a moral guidelines of choosing. And lastly, as men and women of the academy, as people working in a Catholic university, we must always be aware of that social obligations to become an agent for change. The past may have been approved by historical revisionists, but the present is always open. If we will make a definitive stand that corruption should never have a space and a place in government, that people who had been liars should have no space in government. That people who simply doesn't have a track record of serving and loving the poor should have no space in government. That will be the only time that we could say that as a church, as a Catholic university, we are successful in our quest to making every Urian 
to making every Christian an authentic agent for nationalism, religiosity, altruism, and unity. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Father Marlon, for sharing your expertise on this eye-opening data on the national situation and, and how we will integrate this, value, this and our values as an Orient. We shall proceed now to our open forum. We will have, 15 minute, we will have a 15-minute open forum. For Zoom participants, you may write your question in the chat box. For those who are watching us via FB Live, you may also write your questions in the comment section. Our tech assistant, Ms. Diana, will keep track of your questions and will forward it to me. You may ask one direct, concise question, and if needed, another follow-up question. All right, we have a question from Benchev Rodriguez of MA11 via Zoom. His question, Father, if we rely on the new platform, how can we assure the equal information? Even the largest medias here in the Philippines can manipulate information they, post, they posted. In which way can people know the proper information if there are certain data that were absent? Well, two things. If we wanted to know the truth, we have to work for it. That means you can do your own research. We have a bank, a bank for data available. Of course, um, the, the social media had painted the mainstream media as... Uh, purveyors of lies, no? but that is a political statement. Not all are true. There are also mainline media that are truthful to their obligation of reporting. That's a first, meaning do your research. Second, if you are not competent, ask one who is competent of the issue. For example, if you would say, what happened during martial law years? Uh, they said it was never true. Ask someone who had been a victim of martial law. Ask somebody who had been through the worst of times there. So do your research first. Second, ask competent people or experts. Do not rely on uh, colored sources. Thank you so much, Father. Another question? Now, it seems the information they receive from the various social media becomes their ground for truth and facts. How do we present the information and research-based data to them that they would not sound na walang siraan ng kandidato and an approach that would not sound an intellectual elite? Well, as I had said earlier, statement of facts is never intended to destroy a candidate. You know, it may hurt some candidates, but that's the truth nonetheless. And we can never change the truth. Now, owing to the fact that the social media had become the medium now, and I think all candidates are using the, 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 uh, the, the social media platform, I think it is of paramount importance and clear responsibility of the church and Catholic institutions to counter massive social media lies with informations of facts and plain truth. Pero again, as I said, people would always be offended if they knew they are alluded to by a certain fact. But fact may be uncomfortable, but we can never alter it. It is still the truth nonetheless.
Thank you. Another, uh, this is actually a, a comment, no? So this is how the university used, Catholic, university used Catholic for various votes, votes without giving chance uh, for others that support different candidates. Well, I think that's the reason why we are having this political discernment, no? For, for you to come up with your enlightened decisions and choices. Okay. Uh, another, we ha uh, I noticed that an I as an institution, we have not been explicit in our stand on government is issues such as corruption, EJ case, impuni and impunity. How should we, as a Catholic institution, fight against all of this? Well, I cannot speak for FSUU University. Father John and Father Randy are more competent than me. That based on my experience also as a Catholic school administrator for years, you know, uh, it is not necessary that we come to the open to denounce evil. It is by way of inculcating good values, teachings, and virtues to our students that will become our concrete contribution to campaign, to denounce evil, to denounce things that we perceive to be morally wrong. But of course, you are right. Uh, our Catholic uh, institutions, including the church, must openly come up with a definitive position on matters that pertains to our common good, human life, and human rights. Thank you, Father. This is more of a comment from, okay, the name was not uh, mentioned. A political handler of one of the presidential candidates said that misinformation has been inculcated to the young minds early on of which the leading presidential candidate has the mechanism, thus got a strong support from the 18 to 25 age group. Well, you can, you can, you yourselves can, can see that on Facebook. In the last six years, a very strong political machination had been distorting narratives of history, of present facts and actions. We can never deny that. There is this political power who has all the resources, who could pay trolls, who could pay platforms, and they are the ones responsible for the massive distortion of reality through the social media platform. And you can find them in, on social media. They are, they are partying all the time. From Jay Montilla, I know people who are part of martial law before. Why does it have to have different impact to others? Does it mean that martial law differs to what you do before? Well, that, that's the effect of historical revisionism. No? You, you, you tone down what had happened in the past to make it appear as something that is not evil and make it good. Now, the problem with our system, and I dare say our educational system, is its failure to inculcate narratives of facts in history. But people who had been there, I tell you, will never forget the nightmare that Marshall was and how a certain political family had parted here and abroad spending lavishly by the millions of U.S. dollars at the expense of the poorest of the poor in Negros. Okay? Another one from Joshua Limbaga. How do I tell my parents these facts and inform them more about their candidates without offending them? Well, telling the truth will always be, you know, uncompromising. And it will always cause uh, discomfort to, to many people. And I think uh, as a church, for example, uh, th there are some sectors in the church who would refuse to be openly, you know, criticizing evil because of its own weakness. But, you know, 
if you wanted to, to influence other people, they may be uncomfortable with it, but you have to tell them the truth. Because if you would fail them to tell the truth, if you would fail in telling them the truth, then you are therefore taking a stand in favor of the lies that they believe in. Engage in a healthy discussion or dialogue. Uh, do not force yourself. Just state facts. And then do, do, not, do not try to convince them outrightly. Let your statement, your facts speak to them. And let them make their own decision. Thank you, Father. Uh, we will have our two last uh, questions. From Benchev Rodriguez. If during the martial law or the Marcos regime incident where, the, where people were killed, it always revived each year as a form of issue of human rights violation. Since it happened years ago, should we forget the ordered open fire which caused the Hacienda Luisita massacre during the Aquino govern, governance, which is also a form of human rights violation? <laughs> Refusal to learn the lessons of history will definitely lead us to experience it again. Now, when we speak about the killings of the martial law years, it is not simply to pin blame to a politician. It is teaching our people the massive and painful lesson of the history so as we will never allow it to ever happen again. And the last one from Mom and Sally Rosales, a faculty of this university. We observe that almost all churches in the Philippines are endorsing candidates for this coming election. The Catholic Church is even campaigning, which we did not notice this before. This is something new for us Catholics. I cannot help but ask myself, what's the difference now of the Catholic Church with the other churches? Well, we have to understand this and put everything in context. The church had always been involved before. We have the PPCRV, we have the NAMFREL before, and the church had always been given, you know, an entity of impartiality, you know, that had always been there. But since Vatican II, since the 1965 the church had openly speak about politics, its implication, and the evil that it may bring us. And that simply enlightened the minds of people in the church to take an active role and participation in political arena. Now, when the church speak about a certain candidate, it may be construed as politicking and taking side or endorsement. But I don't look at it that way. The church is simply doing its fair share of telling the truth. And telling the truth, the church must have done this long, long time ago. We cannot be complacent with the resurrection of evil. We cannot simply be impartial to the massive pain and problem that besets our people today. And I think what compels so many of us church people to participate in this discourse publicly, it is simply because of the fact that the situation now in the country is so much delicate that the next leader should be able to handle it well taking into cognizance the welfare, the well-being, and the common good of all the people. And as church, we cannot simply be on the sideline. We have to stand. We have to speak out. And I am challenging people in the church, the lay, for example, to be more active in your participation in the arena of political education so as to enlighten our brethren. For my brother priests, 
it is okay to make a stand. That's what Jesus did in his time. Jesus had never been uncompromising when it comes to the truth and the reality of pain and hardship suffered by the people of Israel at that time. He always took the side and the option to be with the poor. To my brother priest, it is not yet too late. To take on the side of the people, to take on the side of the poor is the best thing that we could ever do as altar Christus of our times. And of course, a greater challenge to our bishops, university presidents, administrators. Your influence may definitely help change the course of this country's history. Do not I repeat, do not throw into the garbage that sacred obligation of yours to enlighten the hearts and the minds of our people so that our country will rise up again, not in the manner that politicians had claimed it to be, but rising up as a victorious people of Easter. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Father Marlon. That was quite a learning experience from our speaker. It always helps to have more information so that we can make an informed and responsible decision come May 9. We also want to thank our participants for being engaged in this first session of the Urian Voters Education Series. This time, please allow me to read the Certificate of Appreciation to our speaker. Father Saturnino Urius University presents this certificate of appreciation for the, his invaluable to Father Marlon Lacal for his invaluable service and contribution as resource speaker in the session Urian Core Values: A Guide for Discernment in Choosing the Next Leaders during the Urian Voters Education Webinar Series held on April 21, 2022. Given this 22nd, 21st day of April at Father Saturnino Urius University, Butuan City, Philippines. Signed, Reverend Father James Michael M. Abellanoza, Director, Student and Alumni Affairs, Donna F. Espuerta, Dean of Arts and Sciences Program, Engineer Zenaida D. Azura, Vice President for Administrative and Student Affairs, Reverend Father Randy Jasper C. Ojigi, Vice President of Academic Affairs and Research. A virtual applause, please. As a responsible citizen, we need to cast our vote this coming May 9 elections. Now we understood that voting wisely entails a deep understanding of our values, moral choice, social and political engagement. Inasmuch as we are accountable to God with our vote, we are also responsible to the next generation to this country. And to sum, and to sum up what Father Marlon have mentioned, let us embody our co core values in choosing our leaders through First, unity, in solidarity with the poor, religiosity, in choosing our candidates and to the gospel values, integrity, in consideration of our environment, altruism, in preference and in the desire for the common good, nationalism, for discernment in making sure that we choose the right candidate who can help solve the national issues. As what Father Lakal had mentioned also, the past and the present political and self-interest have come together again. 
the illicit affair of corruption and of old politics is very much alive. Si situations like this would demand that the church and we citizens should make a stand. A great reminder for all of us that our vote, our future. We would like to remind our participants that there are four sessions in this Orion Voter Education Series, and this is just the first one. So tomorrow would be the second session, April 22, Friday at 2 p.m. Our speaker would be Dr. Luis F. Dumlao, Dean of the John Gokong Wei School of Management of the Ateneo de Manila University, and he will talk about the current state of the Philippine economy and the leader we need. To get your certificate of participation, you are requested to answer the evaluation on the link provided in the comment section or the chat box. And now for the exciting part, we shall be opening the first assessment in your Orion Voters Education Webinar Series E-Class that would be found in your NEO LMS or F FSU you learn. The assessment takes a form of a game. So you have to join the game to complete your assessment. The top five of the leaderboard will receive a prize. So watch out for the link and click your way to the prize. The winners will be announced on the session tomorrow. So for GE students, take a screenshot of your score in the game and upload it in your respective assessment in your GE class. So you will also find it there where you could upload. You will earn points for the upload that you do. To claim your prize, you may message directly the Social Sciences Division via, their, via the official FB page. We would like to thank the faculty members of the Social Sciences Division, our speaker, Father Marlon Lacal, Engineer Zenaida Azura, Ms. Donna Esperta, Father James Michael Abellanosa, Dr. Sherlene Alegre, Mr. Lyndon Boki, Political Science and Economic Society, UMSERV and Psychology Society, Communicators Guild, Urian Publication, FSUU Supreme Student Government, and the Strategic Communications Office. That's our first session of our Urian Voters Education Series. This has been your facilitator, Maris Gamalo, with Diana Shane Ranara, our tech assistant. See you next session and let your light shine brighter this election. For our on-site participants, uh, you can ask your questions to Father directly. Now we will have, we will spend a couple of minutes for your questions. Ako'y di bisaya.